Hi, this is Raj Mehta, and this is my second part on my uh, video lecture on electrocardiography. And this lecture, I'm going to briefly be reviewing cardiac arrhythmias. Most of the EKGs I'm going to be showing you in this video were taken from ECG PDM, which is a wonderful resource on reading ECGs if you ever need any help or want to look anything up. Before I begin talking about cardiac arrhythmias, uh, there's a couple important clinical points I'd like to bring up uh, for educational purposes. First is that, remember, whenever you're looking at EKGs, there's always a patient involved. So if you're taking care of a patient who has a new finding that's concerning for an arrhythmia, make sure you see the patient and take a look at them. The clinical context is always important in understanding what's going on with your patient. Once you've seen your patient, it's always important to make sure that your patient is hemodynamically stable. You want to know your patient's vital signs, make sure there's nothing emergent going on. Uh, this is important because if you want to take your time to review an ECG tracing, you want to make sure that your patient is safe and that you actually have the time without doing anything that might adversely affect their health. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing to note about cardiac arrhythmias is knowing what is not a cardiac arrhythmia, and that would be normal sinus rhythm. This is what is the physiologic norm for the human body. When you discuss cardiac arrhythmias, you're really talking about deviations in two ways. Either you're having some kind of abnormal rate, or an abnormal rhythm. So if your rate or rhythm is not a normal sinus rhythm, um, or your rhythm is not a sinus rhythm, that's how you know you probably have an arrhythmia. Now the most common uh, tracings you usually find uh, are sinus tachycardia and that's just when you have a sinus rhythm but the rate is greater than a hundred. You can also have sinus bradycardia that's when your rate is usually less than 50 And you can have something known as sinus arrhythmia, which is you have uh, a normal rate, but you have beat-to-beat -beat variation. And this is most commonly due to respiration, especially in kids. When you inhale and exhale, it can cause beat-to-beat -beat variation that is normal and physiologic. What's important to note is that the most common thing you might find yourself coming across would be sinus tachycardia. But regardless of what the arrhythmia is, most arrhythmias are reversible. So... It's, again, very important to come back to your clinical context to know your patient, because if you know your patient, you know what's going on, regardless of what the arrhythmia is, you can usually reverse it. And this is also true for sinus tachycardia. There's usually some underlying disorder going on that's causing it. Next, let's take a quick picture of a sinus tachycardia EKG. What I have here is a rhythm of sinus tachycardia. You can see clear P waves, a narrow QRS complex, and it's associated. The rate is regular. Uh, sorry, uh, the rhythm is regular, but as you can see, the rate is quite rapid. This rate is uh, over 100 beats uh, per minute, and uh, uh, that P wave is what tells us that this patient is having a sinus tachycardia. So on the right here, I've written P wave, and that's how you know you're dealing with a sinus rhythm. We're going to move along to the next section, and that's dealing with supraventricular rhythms. Now, commonly what I find is that uh, tachycardia or abnormal rates is the first thing you'll notice when you're dealing with a cardiac arrhythmia. So once I look at an elevated rate and I know it's not uh, sinus tachycardia, the next thing I'm trying to figure out is this possibly SVT, or a supraventricular rhythm. And the way I can do that is outlined here. First, I make sure and I look and I don't see any P waves, so I know it's not sinus rhythm. And then I look at my QRS. If my QRS is narrow, then I'm probably looking at a supraventricular rhythm. If my QRS is wide, first I want to look for any signs of a bundle branch block or aberrant conduction. If I'm pretty confident there's a bundle branch block, then most likely that's a SVT. But if there's no bundle branch involved, then you're probably dealing with a ventricular rhythm, and we'll get to that in a second. So, the most common causes of SVT are, well, number one, sinus rhythm, because sometimes you miss the fact that you're having a sinus rhythm. Two, atrial fibrillation. Three, paroxysmal 
sorry, SVT, and four, a junctional or AV nodal rhythm. So let's go through each one of these so you can recognize them on a tracing. First I'll start with atrial fibrillation and there's this wonderful video that you can see the abnormal electrical induction associated with it and in, uh, and in atrial fibrillation uh, classically you can uh, diagnose it based on the fact that you have an irregularly irregular rhythm and you can kind of see that tracing here uh, without any discernible P waves. Next we'll look at some of the other SVT. So I showed you atrial fibrillation. There's also atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is usually regular. Uh, it happens at a beat of usually 300 uh, beats per minute or a variation of that. And this particular one you see this seesaw jagged structure and it looks like a 2 to 1 block in which case every second uh, saw appearance you'll see a beat that goes along with it. And that's pretty characteristic of it. Um, below that you'll see AV reentry note, sorry, H, AV nodal reentry tachycardia and atrial tachycardia and so on. And again to review, when you have an SVT, when you suspect it, first you make sure there's no P wave. Then you look at your QRS. If it's narrow or wide with a bundle branch block, you want to make sure uh, you're not looking at a sinus rhythm. Look for signs of atrial fibrillation. Look for paroxysmal SVT, which is SVT that will come and go in between sinus rhythms and a junctional or AV nodal rhythm. One thing that I'd like to point out is that of these, AFib is the one we most commonly see. And whenever you see someone with AFib, it's always important to write what the rate of it is. Just writing atrial fibrillation by itself doesn't tell you the status of that arrhythmia. It's important to write if it's controlled, which means you have a regular heart rate, somewhere between 60 to 110 beats per minute. If you're having a rapid ventricular response, which is when you have a very high heart rate, RVR, uh, and your AFib is uncontrolled, then that's very important to clinically treat. Or if you're having a slow response, you're having atrial fibrillation with uh, a bradycardia that needs to be treated. So knowing what status your atrial fibrillation is in, is in is very important, as well as diagnosing the fact that you're having atrial fibrillation. Okay, good. Let's move on from supraventricular rhythms and tachycardias to ventricular tachycardias or ventricular rhythms. If you see tachycardia with a wide QRS, that's known as a wide complex tachycardia. Uh, this is a very concerning sign because wide complex tachycardia often is a sign of VT, VT being ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia is a concern because it can lead to cardiac arrest. It usually progresses to VFib, which is ventricular fibrillation, where your heart is no longer pumping, and eventually cardiac arrest, which is something we obviously want to avoid. This is a very important uh, rhythm to be able to diagnose, uh, and it's important because the treatment is very easy. Anytime you see anyone in ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, the answer is always immediate defibrillation. I want to add a caveat that's uh, assuming you're dealing with a patient who is unresponsive. Um, obviously, if you have a stable patient with ventricular tachycardia, uh, for educational point, it's probably not a good idea to shock them. Here is a tracing that is an excellent example of ventricular tachycardia. You see that the rate is tachycardic. The QRS is clearly very wide. Uh, this is monomorphic. It has a very ugly appearance, and you just see these big, wide uh, ventricular beats one after the other. Here is another example of ventricular tachycardia in a 12-lead EKG. It's important to know that ventricular tachycardia rhythms can take different appearances. You can have monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, polymorphic. There's a specific type of tach uh, ventricular tachycardia known as torsades de point, which is a twisting phenomenon, and that usually comes from QTC prolongation. And QTC prolongation is a very common side effect from numerous drugs, electrolyte abnormalities, and CNS uh, problems. Here are some examples comparing those uh, rhythms I just mentioned. At the top you have ventricular tachycardia, then ventricular fibrillation when your ventricular tachycardia progresses to this, and this is a point when your heart's no longer uh, uh, pumping. Ventricular flutter, which you see here, um, an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, that's basically when uh, you having a ventricular beat, a ventricular beats are actually normally very slow, usually they're going to be less than 60. And if it's above 60, it's just considered an accelerated ventricular beat. 
and again, torsades dip point, which is what I mentioned, the type of ventricular tachycardia associated with uh, QTC prolongation. I just want to emphasize again that not all ventricular rhythms are necessarily life-threatening. The ones that we worried about are the ventricular tachycardias. Most of them are very concerning, especially if a patient who's unresponsive or unstable. Next, I want to move on uh, to my next section on cardiac arrhythmias, and that's when you see an arrhythmia that's not necessarily tachycardic and you're not necessarily worried about looking for SVT or ventricular rhythms, you just notice that it's an abnormal rhythm. It's not sinus, or it is sinus, but there's something unusual going on. And uh, the most common things I encounter in this section are uh, premature beats, PACs or PVCs, uh, AV blocks, and bundle branch blocks. And I'm going to just go over these very briefly. So first, I'm going to mention... P Sorry about that. First, I'm going to mention PACs, premature atrial contractions. These are usually pretty benign, and you'll see them quite often. Here's an example of a premature beat in a rather ugly-looking rhythm. You have a normal PQRS, then a, ST a T wave, then another PQRS, then a T wave, then a PQRS. And rather than having this continued pattern, you'll have uh, an atrial beat that comes prematurely, thus being called a premature atrial uh, contraction. When this happens, the sinus node is usually reset, and you usually have a non-compensatory pause, and then you resume uh, your normal uh, PQRS rhythm after that. Next are PVCs. PVCs can vary. If you have two PVCs in a row, that's known as coupling. If you have a PVC with a, after every sinus node, that's known as bigeminy. And if you have a PVC uh, after every two sinus rhythms, that's known as trigeminy. And I'm going to show you guys quick pictures of that. So first, this is a PVC. You have a QRS uh, beat here and a QRS tracing here. And this PVC, you can see, uh, occurs before and out of uh, your regular rhythm. And you notice that it's very wide. It has a much wider QRS, which is how you know it's a ventricular rhythm. And it usually has this unusual, ugly-looking appearance um, as you notice here with this very big depression right after you see the wave. And usually you can make them out uh, because they have a large S portion and it's very different from uh, your normal beat. This is bigeminy where you have a normal sinus rhythm and immediately after the sinus rhythm you'll have a premature ventricular contraction and again a sinus rhythm and a premature ventricular contraction. And when this happens, this is known as bigeminy. Now if you had two sinus rhythms and then a ventricular contraction, that would be trigeminy because it happens every third beat. Uh, if you have two PVCs in a row, I mentioned that's coupling, that's important because that is distinguished from having three PVCs. If you have three PVCs in a row, those aren't PVCs, that's ventricular tachycardia. So the definition of what distinguishes PVCs from ventricular tachycardia is a minimum of three PVCs. Now, you can separate the ventricular tachycardia into non-sustained and sustained. And this is just defined by time. If you have multiple episodes of ventricular contractions that are more than three in a row and it's less than 30 seconds that's non-sustained however if it lasts more than 30 seconds that's a sustained ventricular tachycardia and can be a very concerning finding next i'm going to mention av blocks i'm going to erase and make some space here for myself so av blocks are basically when you have uh, a prolonged pr interval or an abnormality in your pr and there's three types one two three and the second one is broken up into type 1 and type 2. And these are actually called degrees. So you have first degree, second degree, and third degree AV block. And second degree is a type 1 and a type 2. And this is also known as a Wenke block. And this one is known as a Mobitz block. First, I'll begin by showing you a first degree block. In a first degree block, your PQ interval is prolonged. It's more than 0.2 seconds, which is one large box. And uh, your P and your QRS complex is still uh, associated and happening uh, in a predictable, regular fashion, but you just have a prolonged PR. And that's your first degree block, and that's usually pretty benign. Your second degree uh, AV block is broken up into type 1 and type 2, and this is usually a little bit more severe than just a prolonged uh, PR interval. In the type 1, second degree, also known as a one key bike, you have a PR interval, that's normal, and then it gets a little bit longer, and then a little bit longer, and even longer, and then suddenly it gets so long that it becomes disassociated, and you miss your uh, ventricular beat, and so then you have a skip beat, and then you start all over, and you have a normal PR, and it starts prolonging more and more and more. 
it's a classic feature of your Winky block. In your type 2 second degree block or Mobitz block, instead of having um, a prolonged PR interval that progressively gets longer and longer and longer before getting dropped, you just will have uh, an episode of where you'll have a P wave and then no QR associated after it. There's just com a disassociation and you just completely miss your beat and then it goes back to having a regular PQRS. And finally, third degree, this is the most severe form of an AV block, and it's when you have complete uh, disassociation between a P wave and a QRS complex. So you'll see P waves here and here, oop, and here, but your QRS complex is not associated with your P wave at all. Next, we'll move on to bundle branch blocks. Our bundle branch blocks are basically broken up into a uh, few common types. You have a right bundle branch block, a left bundle branch block, you have a, a inner immediate ventricular conduction delay, that's when it doesn't meet right or left bundle branch block. And then you have the most common hemi block, which is your left anterior fascicular block. Now in your regular bundle branch block, you're going to diagnose this because you're going to have a QRS that's greater than 0 0.012 seconds. Whenever you see a wide complex like that, uh, but you see a P wave, um, it's usually a signal that maybe that there's uh, some uh, bundle branch block involved and that may not necessarily be a ventricular rhythm. The fastest way to distinguish between right and left bundle branch blocks is looking at lead V1. If you look in lead V1 and you see this R S R uh, prime complex and usually that's a very positive rhythm because you have a bigger R wave in here than you do S, that's usually a right bundle branch block and conversely if in V1 you see a big S wave and remember that's abnormal because normally you would expect V1 to have a big R wave uh, then that's usually a left bundle branch block. Uh, looking at V6 also helps, and if it doesn't look like either one of these quite, then it may be an interventricular uh, conduction delay. Opposed to this is your left anterior hemi block. Because it's a hemi block, your QRS complex is actually still going to be narrow, so by definition it should be less than 0 0.12. But with this, you're going to have a very pathologic, it's called uh, left axis deviation. And if we look here in lead 2, you see a very big negative S wave which is consistent with a left axis, a left anterior hemi block, and in this particular patient, you don't see any signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. So, it would be uh, unexpected that uh, the left axis deviation would be from that finding. Okay, we've reviewed uh, PACs, PVCs, AV blocks, and bundle branch blocks, um, and that's usually uh, things you'll normally see with a sinus uh, arrhythmia. Next, I want to briefly just discuss the findings of sinus pause and sinus arrest. First off is sinus pause. Sinus pause is something that commonly happens after there's an arrhythmia, such as paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. A PSVT usually has a period where um, the pacing goes into overdrive, and immediately after it resolves, because it's paroxysmal, you return to a sinus rhythm. However, after that period of a PSVT, you often have a compensatory pause. That compensatory pause is also known as your sinus pause. It's during this period of pause when you're not having any contraction that patients will commonly have syncopal episodes or syncope symptoms. So when you're working up syncope and you're worried that arrhythmia is causing it, most commonly it's due to PSVT, and it's not the PSVT arrhythmia itself technically, but it's a sinus pause after you return to your sinus rhythm. This is also known as a post-conversion pause, as you're converting from your SVT back into your sinus rhythm. And so the most common example I have of this is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or which uh, come and go in patients and can be uh, a, a cause of syncope. Now in some patients, you might develop a sinus bradia, cardia, and the rate may get so slow that you can have heartbeats that are less than 30 beats per second. And it gets to the point where you're worried that the patient may actually flatline. And if sinus bradia does continue to slow down, you'll eventually get to a point when you have sinus arrest, which is also just a cardiac arrest because you have a flat line on your tracing. Now when this happens, as similar to when it happens in something such as a sick sinus syndrome, the important way to correct this is to have pacing. You want some kind of external pacing device. And that can be done by a transcutaneous pacing, which you put on someone if they're unconscious, venous pacing, which is another temporary way of doing it, or eventually you can just get someone to have a pacemaker to fix this kind of problem.
That's the end of this talk. I hope you have found it helpful. Thank you.